Okay, well, uh, welcome to the third webinar in the relaunch webinar series on change management. Uh, if you want to access some of the other webinars on vision and on self-care, jump on the Relaunch Australia page. Uh, today we're thinking about change. And I went along to a Myers-Briggs webinar, I think early on in sort of COVID times, looking at the psychology of change. Uh, they had a, a really helpful diagram uh, in that webinar that, that looked at how people reacted to change. You know, the, the expectation of sort of a, a, linear, a linear line is actually not really the reality. It actually takes a lot longer for people to uh, respond, to get on board. And people's experiences of change are a lot like a roller coaster, you know, going up and down. And the role of the leader, uh, the role that you have as, as church leaders is to, is to set vision, to build culture, to develop people. Uh, this is what uh, Cotter, who's written, I reckon, an excellent book on change and kind of the seminal work on it, says, about why leaders fail in change projects. He says this, he says, they overestimate how much they can force big changes in an organization. They underestimate how hard it is to drive people out of their comfort zones. They don't recognize how their actions can inadvertently reinforce the status quo. They lack patience. Uh, enough with the preliminaries, let's get on with it, they say. They become paralyzed by the downside possibilities associated with reducing complacency. People become defensive, morale and short-term results slip. Or even worse, people confuse urgency with anxiety and by driving up the ladder, they push people even deeper into their foxholes and create even more resistance to change. Uh, as I said, I think it's the, the leading book on it. I think it's a really helpful book to dive in on. And helping us today think about this uh, is, is uh, Greg Lee. Uh, Greg's a senior pastor from Hunter Bible Church, which is in uh, Newcastle, just a few hours north of Sydney. It's a city in its own right, 400, you know, 300,000 people or 400,000 people, depending on how you, uh, how you, you look at it and understand it. Uh, welcome to the webinar today, Greg. Thank you, yes. Now, today what we're hoping to do uh, is provide you with some resources so that you can go away and, and do a deep dive yourself. As I said, have a number of breakouts as well so that we can get you talking with each other. I think that's a really helpful aspect of these webinars. We're gonna split it up into two sections. How do you actually manage change and Greg's going to talk about two different types of change that that he sees in church leadership and then uh, there'll be opportunities as I said for questions then we'll think about you and change uh, and then have another opportunity for questions as well um, so as I said use the chat bar down below if you if you've got a burning question and you want to break in um, otherwise we'll, uh, we'll we'll kick off so just before Greg um, we just before I get you to jump into a breakout I uh, just wanted to show you some resources. Uh, you've probably seen some of these things, but I just want to point out a few helpful things about each of these resources, just so you can probably use them and experience them um, better. As I said, uh, John Cotter's book on leading change, uh, is probably the best book out there. Uh, his eight steps have been used, you know, by everyone. Um, you know, so create a sense of urgency, build a guiding coalition, form a strategic vision, enlist a volunteer army, enable, generate, sustain acceleration by getting sort of, uh, you know, quick wins and then institute change by having structures. It's a really useful book to help you see all the elements and processes to do, um, to do with change. And I sent you a link uh, in the registration of this to his updated sort of version of this book as well, which I think really brings in team, uh, the team's aspect of leading change, which I think is so important for uh, church leaders to be uh, understanding. I've found you know, the team pastoring or, you know, Paul's vision of having fellow workers, uh, you know, really vital, I think, to, to leading not only change, but just a leading church. The, uh, the second book is a book by uh, Tom, Tom Rayner. Uh, Tom uh, is, a, I guess, a leading church consultant, writer, researcher on church stuff from the States. It's called Who Moved My Pulpit? Uh, it's based on the story of Derek you know, the pastor of a, a revitalizing uh, church. He, I guess, uh, turns the eight principles on it, you know, on its head and gives sort of a ministry framework for them. What I find it, found it most helpful about this book uh, is the, the, the call to pray. Um, I, I think this is, this is neglected by us in, in change processes. And, uh, and I think we, you know, we need to, we need to be sitting, sitting under God's word and, 
and coming before him in prayer. So I just think it's a helpful reminder there. The other aspect of this book that's helpful is he talks about the different people you experience in church life in a change management process. And so I think, I think uh, that's a helpful book just to, or a helpful chapter to read, just to sort of get a sense of who am I going to face as I lead sort of any change in church life. So to understand how people are going to respond, particularly as you pastor them through this change process. And then the last aspect of the book I think is helpful is this, the focus or the, the movement of churches towards an inward focus rather than outward focus. And so again, chapter six is really helpful in, in sort of getting you to help, you know, reorient your church to having an out, an outward focus. Now, the last book that I want to refer to is, is the Vine Project. Um, really, the Vine Project is all about, you know, reshaping your ministry culture around disciple making. And in that, um, Cole Marshall and Tony Payne have these five phases. Just want to highlight, I think the key one, the key one they talk about there is, is phase two, um, your own personal reform. So that's a really good chapter to read. Um, I think Paul's model of ministry was that he was a, um, a, a model to the people that he, that he ministered to. It was a model that he passed on to those that he worked alongside with as well. You know, he regularly called to attention their behavior and their model as well as he, as he tried to get change. So I think that's a really good book to dip into and, and kind of put the heat under yourself for how you need to lead change you know, yourself and actually model it um, to the rest of your congregations. It talks, uh, they talk about your convictions penetrating the culture of your own life. Okay, so just, just sort of setting the scene, there's some resources and I'll, I'll follow that up uh, you know, in an email just so you can, you can see those resources as well. Now, I just want to move you guys into um, our first breakout. Um, and I want you to consider this question and I'll just give you, I'll give you five minutes, um, five minutes to think about it. What's one area at church you think needs to change and what's stopping you uh, from doing it? So what's one area that needs to change? What's stopping you from doing it? I'm just going to put you in some random groups. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen and, uh, and I'll let you uh, jump in. Yeah, one of the um, one of the really helpful distinctions uh, that was shown to me a few years ago, uh, and in particular, it's just helpful in terms of our experience of change, is the difference between proactive change and reactive change. So, proactive change is change that we're choosing to make because we think it's going to lead to a better outcome. And so, you know, Steve going into a building, this is something that they've chosen because they think, uh, I hope, because uh, they think it's going to lead to better ministry. Um, and it often that proactive change, there's a big cost to it because it involves a lot of energy. You've got to win people to it and so on. But it feels very positive. Our emotions going into it feel incredibly positive because we feel like we're moving to a better place. Reactive change, though, is the change that we don't want to make. We're being forced to make. And so you can imagine the, the crisis situation of sickness in a really key leader. Uh, and therefore, we've got to really change uh, the sin of removing an elder or something like that. I think COVID is a classic example um, where we wouldn't have chosen this. All of a sudden, everything's turned upside down. And so all the attendant feelings for that, things like helplessness, frustration, anger, regret, disappointment, um, because we're not choosing this. It's being forced upon us. Um, one key thing I think I've learned about reactive change, though, is the benefit of the common enemy. Uh, so we've been able to talk about uh, all of these changes that are forced upon us is COVID is to blame, um, which means that it helps people to know who to get frustrated at and, and to, to have a direction for their frustration. Um, we've also been able to use that idea of the common enemy to do some proactive change at the same time, um, to be able to say COVID has enabled us to take something over here a bit more seriously. But there's a big difference between proactive and reactive change. Uh, our experience of them is very different. Um, another, uh, yeah, as we move on to thinking, this is thinking primarily about proactive change. Uh, here is a way that I've started to think about and communicate change. So this is change that we wanna make. Um, I'm not a sailor, so there's every chance that this does not work at all, but I'm reliably informed that the analogy works. Um, 
Sailing gives us, I think, three ways of thinking about change that are all quite helpful. One is destination change. Um, we're on one side of the lake, we're in the middle of the lake, and we're heading to the other side. Um, and what we're talking about there is big differences. So you can imagine it's the destination of where we want to be as a church in 10, 15, 20 years' time. Um, it's not immediate, that big destination change. Um, when you're sailing, though, you can rarely um, sail on one long reach from one point to another. Usually you reach these key moments where you have to change direction, uh, where you've got to change strategy. And the same is true in church. Um, we call these tacking changes. So changing direction in sailing is either tacking or jibing. Um, and it's where you're not changing the, um, the destination of where church is heading, but you recognize that this is a really key moment. Uh, and so it might be um, a key staff appointment. In order for us to grow from 150 to 400, a really key moment for us might be putting on a, a, senior, a second um, senior staff member. Um, it might be putting on another congregation. These are fairly significant events in the life of a church, but they're not destination changes. Um, the destination might still be reach a thousand people or whatever it is, but it's this key moment. And then the third kind of change is the change that is happening all the time, and that's trimming the sails. Um, that constant sense of improving things. So it's you know changing to the timing of something, changing to the format, adding a new growth group in. Um, it's the things that happen year on year that aren't necessarily the key change to the direction of church. They're not the key change to the destination of church, certainly, but it's just the constant change of things we do every year. One of the things that happens is as you get bigger, things that used to be tacking changes actually become trimming changes. So when you're moving from one senior staff person to two, that's a big tacking change. When you're moving from 10 to 11, that's a trimming change. Um, and so how you, what you call them really is dependent on the size that you're at. But those three um, are fairly crucial. Uh, those three are fairly helpful distinctions a fourth one uh, might be, though, um, destination correction um, or course correction, where you go, our destination of where we hoped we'd go, turns out we were wrong. We actually think we should have been going there. Um, or we realised that we made the wrong decision when we started that second congregation. That tack, we went the wrong way. Um, that's reactive change. You to think about it, realising that you did the wrong thing. Um, and hopefully you won't have to do too much of that, but that's kind of a fourth type of change in brackets. Yeah, Greg, um, Greg that's, re that's really helpful. In, you're kind of setting the scene to say that change is a normal part of ministry all the time, every time, you know, so we're experiencing obviously something that's not normal by having so much change at the moment. Yeah. But through the course of the, of the year, you need to be challenging the status quo, um, you know, creating a sense of urgency you know, for changing church life. I guess one of my questions for you is how much urgency is enough? You know, how much trimming and tacking change, you know, can and should you do over the course of a year? Um, that, I think that depends on a bunch of things. It can depend on the age of the church, the size of the church, the amount of trust that's in the leader, and also the scope of the change. So when you think about it, you can make changes in your youth group, your mission team, and um, your growth group team all at exactly the same time because there are different people in them and you're the only one feeling the cumulative effect of the change mm. um, and so you can make three quite big changes all at the same time if the people aren't common um, whereas it's very difficult to make three church-wide changes and so the question of how much change um, is enough or too much, I think depends on some of those variables of who is involved, how you're perceived, how significant the change is, is a direction change and so on. Um, but your point about constant change is true. I think um, as people join our church, we do warn them that we're always trying to do things better uh, and that things will change around them uh, and that uh, there's this inevitability to it. And we kind of catch it in terms of Change is a really good thing in the Christian life, isn't it? Jesus mm. is moving us from immaturity to maturity and he's moving his church from immaturity to maturity. And we also catch in terms of love. 
we want to love people better. Um, and what that means is we're always looking for what is the way that is most loving to do it and we're going to change whenever we can spot a new way. So the, the way you explain it can make change easier there. Now, Greg, you talked about destination change and managing destination change. Yeah. Um, uh, how, um, yeah, how and what do people need to be thinking about in that course? Because I think COVID's given us the opportunity, you know, to think about the big picture of, you know, where do we want to go? And actually ask that question, is, is that destination that we've been aiming for the right destination? So if a church leader is thinking, no, actually, the where we want to go is very different now, how do you manage that destination change? Yep, so we're going to jump over trimming change, is that right? Yeah, I think so. Just for time. Yeah, good. yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so managing the, the change in the direction of your whole church, obviously, this is a really disruptive event, isn't it? Um, and this is the sort of thing that, that, that people will get very anxious about, um, especially if you're new, you know, if you're the one coming in and you're making these changes, or if they've been involved for a long time, there's a high degree of spelling. So managing destination change is definitely the most disruptive thing. Um, we tend to think about it in, in terms of the people versus the leader. So um, thinking about the people involved um, and the leader involved, um, yeah, Kubler-Ross actually do have a really helpful way of describing people's emotional response to change. Um, I remember reading Larry Osborne's book, uh, Sticky Teams, where he talked about how he tended to over-spiritualise people's responses. So when people were a bit negative to change, he immediately assumed it's because they were hard-hearted. And then he realised one day it's actually just because they're human. Um, and that as human beings, we do tend to respond to change uh, in different ways. And so I found this actually, the, the Kubler-Ross curve there, very accurate um, for big change. People do respond with shock. Um, they, they, they go into denial, no, we don't need to do this. That's not gonna happen. The frustration, depression, and then there's a slow move out of it. The big take home of this graph for me has always been, um, I am further along the curve than the rest of my church. And I need to not expect them to be a decision and integration when really they're back at shock. Um, I've, got to, I've got to go back six months to my own experience, in my own experience and walk through with them. The second big take home is I almost never invite people to buy in when I first pitch an idea. Um, if you say, here's an awesome idea, do you think we should do it? The answer is almost always going to be no. Um, and so what I'll do is, here's an awesome idea. I want you to just go away and think about it for a little bit. I want you to, we, we're going to have some conversations. I personally think that this is good. Otherwise I wouldn't have brought it to you. Um, but I give them space. If you go for decision-making straight away, inevitably you'll fall at the first hurdle. So that's, there are two things that I think I've really learned from, um, that Kubler-Ross diagram. Yeah. So I know you, uh, you, people, this is really helpful. People experience change differently and often, often it's a, a sort of a roller coaster of emotion. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's a helpful way of uh, thinking about it. I just want to open it up uh, now for, for questions from, uh, from everyone. Um, before we, uh, before we chat about, I guess, some key, you know, some key people, some key, key members that you're going to experience in a, in a change process in a ch in church life. So do you guys have any questions? Yep, I'll unmute you. Go for it. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I guess we, um, our eldership, our session had a SWOT about COVID and we came up with some good actions, including communication. That's separate to our overall vision and goals for the church, but I wonder if we should be communicating a special COVID vision. And we sort of had this motto that one church, many networks, something like that, and specify. Yeah not just COVID compliance, but our vision for this time, which is probably going to be June next year, if not longer. Yeah. Um, did you want me to jump in on that, Scott? Yep. Yep. Um, I think, Rob, you're exactly right. Uh, in March, um, I think it was like the second week of March when all of this began to unfold, we did sit down as a team and we looked at some of our values during this time. Uh, we came up with five key goals during COVID 
Um, and it's interesting that they were very similar to where we were going to take the church to the destination anyway, but they were just informed by this context. And I think that is the key thing, isn't it? That um, what we're asking is how can we use COVID to help us to get where we want to go not just survive? Um, and so our five key goals were very obviously um, a COVID interpretation of that big dis destination goal for us. Um, in a sense, if you didn't address the, the elephant in the room of COVID, people would go, well, this is a bit weird. Why are we, why are we operating as if it's business as usual when clearly the world's in crisis? Yeah. If our vision, COVID vision, was totally different to the destination one, people would be going, well, does that mean that the destination one was the wrong one if I can't cope with this? And so working between those two um, has really helped. So for us, mission um, was a huge part of our COVID goal. Um, we were praying that more people would become Christians during COVID than would normally become Christians during this period of time. Um, because we really wanted people to see that we're still heading towards the destination. God is still sovereign and so on. Yeah. That's helpful. Good question, Rob. Um, other questions? Yeah. Yep. Go for it. Wayne. Just in the reading you had us doing from Cotter in that um, thing. Um, early on, it was develop a coalition of people who are going to be on board with your change. Mm. And I was trying to think about what that would be in the church context because he was talking about people from all levels of your organisation. So if we have our elders on board and then our growth group leaders, is that our change coalition? Or are we looking for kind of a separate group which has people from all the different levels? So I was just trying to think about what that actually meant. Yeah, gu build a guiding coalition. Is that your, say, key department leaders and then your growth group leaders or is it something another entity that you're creating i think it's helpful to see those elders and those growth group leaders as your constant guiding coalition uh, for constant change trimming change and forming destination change but there may be certain projects where you want to build um, a coalition alongside them uh, mm -hmm. i'll give you an example of that we three years ago we decided to do a building campaign um, now, clearly, I needed the staff involved and the elders on board and so on. But also, what we got was we invited, I think it was 30 or 40 people over to my house, um, mm -hmm. pitched the vision to them, won them, and then got them to visit house to house. Right, um, okay. So that they sold the project to everyone else. Um, we couldn't have done it without the normal leadership structures being involved. But there's an example of, for a key project, deciding that we wanted um, a different coalition again. Um, yeah. So it's, it's interesting, um, Wayne, Cotter, Cotter in his book that he you know, wrote in, uh, I think, the, the 90s, talked about selecting two or three people, and he talked about strong position power, broad expertise, high credibility. So that trust that Greg mm. you know, pushed into. Then what, in the next one, he has it bigger, I think. Yeah, that's it. So, so that's the reason I, I sent that to you, because... He wrote that in 20, he wrote Accelerate in 2014. And I think, I think there's been a culture change, you know, so, you know, so all the movement thinking that's out there, but, but he still has a select few and then a diverse many. And so I know, I know a number of churches who have used this moment to uh, talk about reopening and restarting churches as a church plant, you know, and we, we want, want to get people in the launch team. Um, and, and what that's done is it's given the opportunity for, for other leaders to sort of bubble up and other people who, you know, I guess the early adopters in your church to, mm. to get on board. And so I think if you just, if you just look with eyes at, you know, your growth group leaders or your existing leaders, then I think there's an, op you've lost the opportunity to, to find, you know, to find others. So mm. I think the, the key part, you know, finding this, this, this guiding coalition is having eyes to see, you know, who's excited about this and who has those management or those leadership skills or is able to sort of cast that vision, um, yeah. you know, for me. I think in church world as well, we're very conscious of um, the difference between soft and hard power. So you've got your elders and your staff who have hard power um, because they've been given a role, but then there are people in your congregation who are incredibly influential and everyone listens to, mm. and maybe that's actually a bad thing because um, you've chosen not to give them hard power. You've chosen not to give them a role, 
but yeah, crazy to ignore it. Um, and I'm very, I'm always. So I was really going to ask about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You We've got that. people in church who have a big influence, but they're slightly left of center. And so you haven't got them growth group leading. And I'm thinking, do they form part of our coalition? Cause it'd be great to have them on board or is the energy that we're going to sink into them because they're not quite on board, not worth it. So it's like, I'm not sure. Do you try and grab just the core people or do you try and grab some of those kind of influential people? What do you do with those people? You get me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine uh, with two different changes that you want to make. So with one change going, I, we can bring them safely in here because yeah, okay. they're be fine. another change going, we need to neutralize them. Um, yeah. And not okay. So it could be that say you guys were going to um, plan another congregation you wouldn't make them part of the leadership team of that. But say you decided you wanted to increase the size of your building, you may make them part of that because they're safe in that context. Um, yeah, the great clarity you've brought is different guiding coalitions. It's not just one guiding coalition for every change. You're yeah. actually picking people that will help you with that change. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. That's yeah, helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And again, pushing into the leadership pipeline, seeing, seeing that uh, a role of say a ministry area leader or even a team leader is, is to actually cast that vision, you know, the vision that's been set by the eldership or the parish council or the, or the church leader at the top. So actually that's a real competency and, a, and, a, and, an, and an area that you need to coach your, your team leaders uh, in, in your church as well. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to keep uh, pushing, pushing on, um, uh, Greg. Uh, so we'll hold off questions there. Um, I just want to quickly, just before we jump into the next section, as I said, Rainer's, um, Tom Rainer's book, I think, is really helpful. Uh, and one of, one of the key chapters, I think, to read is a chapter where he talks about the unmovable members that you see in church. So he has these little characters. He talks about the deniers. Uh, he talks about uh, the entitled, the blamers, the critics, and the confused. Uh, there's other, other ways. You know, I think there's a whole bunch of different guys who have different pictures and different clip arts that you know, picture, these, picture these people. Uh, but recognizing that there will be people who won't respond well to change, understanding who they are and thinking into the strategies to actually, um, you know, unlock that change. So the denier, one of the most difficult to lead in change because they, they don't think anything needs changing. You know, church is fine just how it is. Uh, so there's no motivation to do things differently. The entitled, they resist change constantly. Um, they don't want anything that upsets their way of, um, of, doing, of doing church. You know, so thinking through it, how do we how do we upset that? The blamers, um, uh, they you know they see all the problems residing in other people and in other situations. So there's nothing wrong with themselves, or there's no need for themselves to change. The critics are always blaming um, blaming others, and then that last one there, the the confused, which I think are really a really an interesting category. Uh, they are you know they're keen on change, but they keep on they keep on moving to other things that actually are taking you away from the right uh, destination. So reading, you know, reading something on on who to expect and how to move them is a helpful thing um, to do. Okay, uh, I want to send you just quickly. This will be a shorter one. Um, just in the break round, uh, breakout rooms. How have you personally responded to change during COVID? So this will only be like two minutes. So spend thirty seconds uh, on this. Uh, you know, thirty seconds each if in your breakout room. So I'm going to send you to breakout rooms again. We're going to talk um, about the leader and change. So, just keep keep fresh that breakout. And uh, Greg, what are what are two or three things that you need to think about as a leader with change? Yep. So, I think uh, a key idea here is we naturally think that an idea will stand or fall based on the quality of the idea. Um, but we've already seen that an idea can stand or fall based on the people who we're pitching it to. Um, I think there are three things about you as a leader. Um, that will affect whether or not the idea will stand or fall. Um, one is your personality type. I think it really is worth knowing, um, knowing your personality well. And I think Myers-Briggs, DISC, all of those things, the helpful thing about them is they just give you a, a sense of the kind of personality you are. So do you love change? Um, uh, are you fairly direct command and control? Are you a persuader and influencer? Those things. Um, 
knowing how your personality is going to affect this change is really important. I think the second thing is knowing the skills and the strength that you naturally rely on. Um, so I'm naturally a communicator. I'm naturally gregarious, but I'm not a planner. So I need to build my change management around that. Um, this is, I think, a, a helpful um, graph, the one that's on the screen now, leadership um, versus management. And so if you're generally that kind of high leadership, um, low management leader, um, then you're going to be pitching big term results, but you're going to have very little in the way of an idea of how to get there. If you're a management as opposed to a leadership person, you're going to be very big on um, the process that we've got. We know what tomorrow looks like, but we're going to struggle to make the 10 year plan. Um, recognizing your skills there means that you can pitch it uh, in a way that's most likely to succeed and give yourself the right job. To be honest though, I think a really key question that almost we almost never ask is, what role has everyone else cast me in? Um, there's how you see yourself, but then there is the role that your church has put you in. So are you the new guy? If you, if you come in as the new guy, that's how everyone sees you, you can try and make big changes, you're gonna fail. Um, are you the hothead? The guy who just pushes everything through? Do they see you as the steady hand? the guy who's gonna keep everything ticking along, but he's probably not gonna be able to lead us through anything big. Do they see you as the flighty visionary, the one who'll never really land on anything? Um, how do they see you and what will they allow you to do? Um, so for instance, a Presbyterian context, if they see you as the, um, the first among many, and they really have this strong eldership view that you're not the senior pastor and you come in pitching big vision and big change without a recognition of that, then it's going to fall flat, isn't it? Because they just haven't seen you in that role. Um, it really is worth asking yourself quite humbly, how do they see me? There are three things on the leader, um, personality, skills and the role. Yeah, we've got time for probably one question there. So I don't know if anyone wants to just quickly interact with Greg, push back on him, tell him that he's, Understanding Presbyterian governance is, you know, all over the place. I realise that they're often very different. <laughs> no, it is. It is helped to understand your governance model. I think that's really yeah. Good. Okay, um, Greg, what I want to what I want to want you to push into now is um, is sort of your reflections on Cotter's eight step change model because it it really is the you know it's the seminal work on it. How have you interacted with it? What are your key uh, key reflections? Yeah. I, yeah, I would say um, buy this book, read it, digest it. Um, the two things are, about it that I would really say is, one, it's intuitively how people work. So we discovered the Cotter book after we'd made it an enormous change to our church um, and went back and read it and found that by being thoughtful and prayerful and all those things, we'd basically followed his, his model. And that's a really good thing. It shows you that intuitively it works. Um, the second thing that I would add to it, though, is it's not, it's broadly linear, but not entirely linear. You're always creating a climate for change. You're always implementing change. It's not, they're not discrete steps. Um, the third thing I'd say is culture has to be thought of alongside this. The culture that you've built in your church and that already exists um, kind of affects everything that Cotter does, but it doesn't get talked about as much. I think, um, and I, I think uh, just your second point on it's not linear. I think that's where, you know, that's where seeing it as a circle diagram rather than this sort of stepped process. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, helps, I guess helps the, it helps the non, -pro, well, it helps the process driven leader yeah. realize that it's not, okay, I've done one. I've got my, created my sense of urgency. Now I go to step two. You're yeah. constantly moving in, in and out of these things, which is, Really helpful for the creating short-term wins yeah. of, um, you so, know, of step six. Yeah, even in the first three there, when you think about it, as the leader, you're going to be developing vision and strategy even before you create urgency and even before you build the guiding coalition, but they're going to help you to shape that. You know, there is an iterative process here. Um, and so that's really helpful. The, the recognition that the culture of your church alongside it, the pre-existing culture, uh, is going to impact this we've found helpful. That is, our church quite likes change. It embraces change, um, which means that some of these things are really easy. Um, Excellent. So you've got four reflections. 
<clears throat> yeah. let's just jump into uh, the first one there. Reflection on the burning platform or creating that sense of urgency or dissatisfaction. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so in terms of that, people are really big on the burning platform. I'm, um, I'm sort of big on it. I recognise that there is um, uh, a usefulness to it. Let me give you some drawbacks, though, uh, of going to the burning platform. One, it can undermine your leadership by saying the platform is burning because people will say, well, how did you lead us into a burning platform? Um, surely you should have avoided this. It can tap into fear and fear by and large is an experience that people don't like. And so it can mean that every change becomes a reactive change instead of a proactive change. It can lock you into whatever solution you come up with. So you told us the platform was burning and you said this was the great answer and now you want to change the answer. Um, and also, it can stop being effective over time because it's a bit like the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And over time, people go, the sky clearly hasn't been falling. You have overpitched the burning platform. Um, I do believe that when a platform is burning, definitely tell people the platform is burning. I think, though, a better long-term motivation is gospel urgency. If you go to our church and say to them, we're doing this, and it's actually working okay, but that will lead more people to be converted, our church will jump on board with that because there's this sense of gospel urgency. And so for me, that's the go-to rather than the burning platform. Um, but I will use the burning platform when I really do believe it's burning. So they're my thoughts on the, the burning platform. Okay, so uh, last week's seminar, or last week's webinar, you really talked about vision. Uh, yeah. Good vision. So uh, there's a helpful sort of change formula, DVP, dissatis dissatisfaction times vision times planning equals change. And so if any one of those is, is not sort of working well, you mm. actually reduce your ability to change, uh, change people or change in a situation. So yeah. vision is critical as is planning, but tell us about vision. Yeah. So last week we talked about this. Here are some thoughts on presenting vision to people in terms of change. Um, I think it's a good mix of paper and people. That is, you don't just produce your doctrine, your vision statement. You have people who champion it uh, and who reflect it, namely the leader first and, for, first and foremost, but people who've come into your church reflecting that the vision is taking place. Um, whenever we're making change, I think it's helpful to show people the kind of change it is. Is this destination change? Is it tacking change? Are we correcting our course? A big, a one that I'm huge on, is creating a story for your church. Um, so when we did the big um, uh, money raising thing three years ago for a building, we created a narrative for our church that we started off as this ragtag bunch of people who there was 15 of us and we, were, we really had no idea and isn't God amazing, he's taken us on this journey to a thousand people and now we wanna go somewhere else. And there is a story that people will love to buy into. It has to be a real one, but unless you tell the story, people won't know it. Uh, and it has enormous power to get people to move to change because this is the next step. There are key words and phrases. So the ragtag bunch just came out again and again and again. Um, key words and phrases and images that you might want to use. We do believe in using slogans, headlines, uh, that just capture what we're doing. Um, another way of distinguishing it is uh, it needs to hit people's head. There needs to be a logical plan. Uh, then it needs to make sense. It needs to hit people's heart, what they're really passionate about. So remember last week in the seminar, we were talking about um, good visions are aspirational. It has to affect the person I really want to be. And then it also, people have to see how it's doable in terms of their hands, which leads to the roadmap. So there's some thoughts. I think we covered most of that last week. Can I, can I just push in, uh, Greg? Repetition is really important, you know, so that's something that Cotter talks about. How do you, how do you keep fresh when you've told the story, you know, 10 times already because you visited 10 home groups this week? How do, you, <laughs> how, do you keep it, how do you keep it fresh and exciting? My personality, this is where it does come into the leader and personality. Um, I can walk into a room completely depressed and within seconds I'll be so excited about it because I live very much in the moment. So for me, that's never a hard thing. Um, but one way to keep it fresh is you keep using the different, person uh, and the new person to tell the church's same story. Um, 
So the person who was recently converted is they're reliving and joining this church's story. Um, and we do that a lot. Everyone who's converted, we film, you know, each child who's born, we're bringing them into the church story, each new event. Um, it's not that your church has one story like a testimony. It's that your church has this overarching narrative and everyone can slot into that. And so you tell the same narrative with different characters. Yeah, you make change sound so easily. Surely you've never had to come up against resistance. So what are, what, are you, what are your thoughts for those other churches that have resistance and, you know, you don't have, obviously have that at Hunter Bible Church, Greg? Yeah, yeah. This is really helpful, isn't it? This is something that I got from somewhere else, someone else. Um, remember the Larry Osborne thing where he said, we tend to spiritualize resistance. The reason they're opposing me is that they're just really ungodly. <laughs> they don't have a kingdom mindset. <laughs> uh, or they're one of those different personalities, you know, that we're all really negative, you know, the denier, the, the you know. Um, however, there are genuine reasons um, that people will have for resisting. Um, so their personality can be a low tolerance for change. Sometimes it is self-interest. Um, you're changing from something that I like. It can be that they really do misunderstand. Um, there is the feeling of being disenfranchised. I'm not sure I trust you guys. You promised change before and it didn't happen. Or you may change and it didn't go well for me. Sometimes it is change fatigue. During COVID, people have gone through a lot of change. Um, and there are two ways of thinking about that. While we're in the mood for change, do we want to make bigger change? Or how far can we push our people? There's a, it's a judgment call. Sometimes people just genuinely disagree. They just think it's the wrong call. Um, and, so, uh, and sometimes it's that they're too early in the Kubler-Ross change thing. Um, we do... What the, the take home of this is, you just genuinely got to listen. Um, I do spend, at the moment, I'm visiting every growth group in church that, that I can. We're, there's about 80 growth groups in church. Um, two nights a week, I'm going and I'm just saying, I'm here to answer your questions. I'm going to pray with you. Um, and I'm not trying to convince them of anything at the moment. Mm. But what that's doing is showing people that I recognize that the questions they've got are not a product of sin. Mm, that's really helpful um very helpful so think into kubler ross uh think into an understanding where where someone's at uh and don't don't over spiritualize it as well they're people yeah. you know they're people responding okay uh the last one reflecting on reflection number four uh making change the new normal so we've talked about challenging the status quo how do you make that just part of your operating structure of your church yeah, yeah. Um, one of the biggest mistakes we make in full-time ministry is um, we do something like we run a weekend away, but we never think about what's happening afterwards. Um, we make a change, but we don't think about how to embed it afterwards. And that's because for us, the next project looms so large. Um, uh, but this is where Cotter really helps by saying, you've really got to bed this in. Um, here are some thoughts about that we've found work. Keeping on celebrating it, um, and saying, wow, this really worked, didn't it? Look, um, more people have joined church. Our growth groups have gotten, our growth group leaders are better trained, all of those different things. So pointing back and celebrating it, um, showing how it contributes to that destination. We are one step closer now to reaching 30,000 people for Christ in our region or whatever it is. Um, for a change to really stick, I do think it has to change your team structure and sometimes your staff structure and your budget structure. Mm. I've realized no one takes seriously anything unless it finally reaches the budget. Um, and so it should affect your budget or it should affect your team structure. So we now have six teams instead of five. Um, there should be a leader for it. Um, it should change your church's vocab. So for us, we moved from congregational pastors to an M structure and it really did change our church's vocab. Um, an example of that was I visited a church a growth group last night and the growth group leader was talking in terms about the five M's and it was just part of his way of thinking about church and his vocab. Um, making this event part of your church's story and folklore. Um, this was a big moment for us when we bought a building. This was a big moment for us when we started that congregation. It's part of that overall um, that overall narrative that we're trying to help people to jump on board with, 
to go, wow, yeah, that was a really key moment in our life. That was the 21st birthday kind of moment. And people really get in board with it. Frankly, admitting its failures and drawbacks is really helpful. I think any time, if someone says, what did you learn from that? And you go, nothing, it was an unmitigated success. No one believes that. Being able to say, here are the things that we found hard. Here are the things that we didn't do well. Here are the things that we, we're still trying to work on changing. Um, and forecasting that something might only be a change for time because people like to think that every change is permanent. Mm. Um, and so when we first started talking about a building, we immediately started talking about selling whatever building we bought because we were assuming that the building we had wouldn't last forever. Um, and so I think it's important, even as you sell the idea first, recognize that this may not be, this may just be a tacking change. It may not be a destination change um, and forecasting that there'll come a time when even this change will change again. There's some thoughts about how we bed it in. Greg, really appreciate your time this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you and, um, and pray for us uh, and church leaders across Australia. So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just give thanks for your love and your goodness. Uh, thanks that you are uh, the great change agent. Um, thanks that you uh, unlock hard hearts and incline them towards you. And we pray that you might do that all across Australia and, and across your world. We pray that particularly in this time where people uh, need the hope that's found only in you, uh, need the, the certainty and the sureness that's only found um, in uh, the new creation that you have won for us through the death of Jesus and through his rise into life. And uh, I just pray for us that you might help us to be uh, really thoughtful about how we think about change, but you might help us to be, um, I guess, uh, pushing people to be getting on board with that bigger gospel vision, uh, that bigger vision that you're uh, capturing us in, in terms of building your kingdom uh, and moving towards changing lives. And so we ask that you might do more of that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I just want to just finish by saying um, all these resources are going to be on the Relaunch Australia website. Uh, but if you're thinking about church planning, head to GenevaPush.com. Uh, if you are a pastor of an established church and you're wanting to get more skilled and resourced uh, in this space, just two, two or three areas to, to push into. Reach Australia uh, can provide you with a coach. Uh, Reach Australia can also provide you with a, um, a, an online consult and a face-to-face -face consult to think into some of these issues. Uh, and, and really, the, the key part of what we're trying to do at Reach Australia is actually to work with Christian leaders and their teams via a two-year development program. So just jump on the reachaustralia.com.au page and check out, um, check out the, uh, the development program and, and see if that's something for you. Um, Derek uh, Hannah, who works with Geneva Push, is more than happy to talk to you about church planning and, and I'm also more than happy to talk to you about uh, church and how you can get it uh, healthy, evangelistic and multiplying. So thanks for joining us for today's webinar and we look forward to catching up with you soon online, but more than that, face-to-face. Uh, when we can actually yeah. again. The National Church Life Survey tells us that most Australians don't even know a Christian. So to reach this country, we have some work to do. We're living in an increasingly secular age where the number of Australians attending church each week is less than 10%. And the number of people ticking no religion on the census is steadily on the rise. The church is God's vehicle to advance the gospel and grow believers to bring the message of salvation to the world. New churches are five times better than established churches at reaching people who don't regularly attend church. People are lost without Jesus. The best way to reach people is to plant new churches. New churches reach new people. A third of the average church plant is made up of people who've never been part of a church. That's why Geneva are committed to planting hundreds of churches across Australia. We're a non-denominational, theologically driven Australian network. Geneva Push aims to inspire, equip and unleash a new generation of church planters for the hard work of evangelising churches into existence across Australia. With God's strength, we're inspiring men and women with the vision of establishing healthy church planting churches and aiming to recruit thousands of planters and team members to reach the millions of lost people across our country. We're equipping church planters by offering clear, effective and rigorous assessment, ensuring the people sent out and their plans are the best suited for building healthy, evangelistic churches. 
we're unleashing a network of generous church planters and strengthening them by developing a peer network, effective coaching and quality Australian resources. You can be part of this vision. You can partner with us by starting your own church planting journey, by sending out a church plant, by giving to the work of the network to help us do more, or by bringing the needs of the network before God in prayer. Join us on the front line as we spread the gospel to a nation that desperately needs to know God. By establishing new churches, churches that will plant more churches. For the glory of His name.